Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Freint, and I am a senior solution engineer here at Cardo. And I am going to run today's spatial spotlight webinar, where we're going to go over how we can use H3 as a discrete global grid to work with really large data sets of point geometries, and we can My more effectively Aaron visualize. Freint, and I am a senior solution engineer here at so before we get into it, I um, just want to quickly go over what is a spatial index, um, because we'll be using it for the duration of this webinar. So a spatial index, also known as a discrete global grid or a hierarchical grid, is essentially a way of taking the planet Earth, chopping it up into individual parts that are all roughly the same size, and then build relationships across resolutions. So depending on the zoom level that you're viewing the map, you might see a larger hexagon or a smaller one depending on the relevant area that you're looking at on the screen. And so what we're gonna do is start with a really large point data set so we can understand how this H3 system works in terms of visualization. So the data that we're gonna be using today is sourced from the marinecadaster.gov website. This data set shows vehicle traffic as a set of GPS breadcrumbs. It comes from the automatic identification system collected in this case by the US Coast Guard. And so with this data, we can go ahead and download for any year that we want. Um, there's individual files for every day. This is a large data set. So every day of data is about one gigabyte in terms of a CSV. So in advance of this webinar, I went ahead and downloaded all of the 2022 data. I brought it into BigQuery and I now have a singular table where I have all of the records from the entire year of 2022 available. And that's what we'll be working with today. So moving on to the Cardo workspace, this is the landing page for the Cardo product. And you'll be able to see different portions of this platform as I work through today's webinar. The first thing that we're gonna do is visit our data explorer. This, when you create connections to the different warehouses that you might be using, all those will show up here in a list, and you can navigate all the different data sets and tables within any of your connections, all from this one interface. And so what I'm gonna do is start by showing the raw data. So when I imported this data into BigQuery, it did not have a geometry out of the box. However, instead, what it provided us with is a latitude and a longitude as floats. And what we can do is we can parse that into a point, and then we can convert that point into an H3 geometry. Before we get to H3 though, let's take a closer look at this data and, and how it shows up on the map. So this is another version of that same table. The only difference is I've converted those latitude and longitude numeric values into point geometries. The only difference we're seeing. And so now we can obviously see this as a map-based preview because we have point geometries. And here we are looking at the area around San Francisco and this is, this is actually not the whole data set. This is filtered just to the vessels that were involved in fishing activities. But even, even with this filter, we can see you know, quite a bit of, uh, of data on our screen. And in some areas, there's a lot of points either right on top of each other or very nearby. And so what we want to be able to do is to, again, convert these into H3s so we can then do some aggregation instead of showing a stack of points nearby that the user kind of has to sort of eyeball and figure out how many points are there, we can actually count the number of points and show that as a color on the map instead. So to do this, we're gonna just have to convert these points into H3. And that is what we have here. So this is the output and I'll show how I created this in just a moment. But the thing I wanted to draw your attention to is that instead of a point geometry, we're creating a column, we're calling it H3. It's encoded as a string, so it's a text type. And we can see these values here. They start with an 8A and they end in a number of Fs. This is a geographic identifier for a specific place on Earth at a specific resolution, which was drawn out of the point data that it came from. So that all said, I'm going to now move to my next tab where I have the Cardo workflow tool loaded up. This is a low code slash no code interface where you're able to create analyses and, and other ETL processes that you might want to run against your data, all in a point and click interface. And then you can run these either sort of as a one-off operation, or you can even schedule them to run on you know, some sort of frequency that you might need. The way that this works is you connect to one of your warehouses, and then you have the ability to 
go in and add tables that you might have in one of your warehouses. You can drag and drop them onto the screen as I've done with my raw 2022 table. We also have access to components. These are also things that you can drag and drop onto your screen and they will do different operations to your data and they're organized by topic. So we have things like aggregation, data prep, joins, spatial analysis, et cetera. And once you've dragged all these different things onto the screen, you can connect them to each other, you can adjust the parameters, and then when you run it, it will compile all of your logic down to SQL and it will run within the warehouse that you've connected. And so just to look through what we're doing here, I'm loading up my raw table, which in its initial state is 2.9 billion rows, billion with a B. It's a lot of records. So the first thing that we're gonna to want to do is we're gonna to wanna to filter this. So I have this simple filter node in my workflow. And here on the right-hand side, we can see the parameters that I've selected. So in this case, I'm saying, I wanna filter against the vessel type column where the value is equal to the number 30. In this case, 30 is the ID for the type known as phishing. Once we've filtered this, we can convert the lat lawn fields into a geography point, which is what we're doing here with this ST geog point uh, node. The other thing we can do here is as, we've, as we're clicking through our workflow, if we've already run it once, we can actually expand this window on the bottom and we can see the data sort of as it evolves. So if I click back to my initial node, we can see, just like we saw before, we have a lat long but no point geometry. By the time I run this geog point function, the geom column now appears and it, we can see that we have a point geometry. So then the next thing I want to do is to be able to turn this into an H3. So the next node takes the geometry column as an input and I've provided resolution 10 as the size of the H3 hexagon I'd like to receive in response. And now at the bottom, we can see we've got, in addition to our point geometry column that's still there, we also have this new H3 column. And straight from this interface, we can also click here to see a map and we can actually see a preview of that data in its current state in this workflow. So this is, you know, at this point in the process, this is what this data looks like. The final steps in this workflow are relatively simple. All that we're doing here are dropping the geometry column because we no longer need that. We're going to be using the H3 identifier instead. And then the final step is to save the output of this workflow as a table back into my BigQuery. So by running this, I've gone from my raw data without geometries through the process of filtering to a, you know, a, a, a subset of the data I'm interested in, converting to points and then to H3 and then persisting the result back into my BigQuery data set. So now that I've done all this, I want to make a map and I want to actually explore this data in a visualization. So to do that, I can go back to my Carta workspace and I can visit our maps page and I can click the button to create a new map. This will open up a blank interface where I can add data sources, I can style them and configure any kind of interactions I might want the user to be able to, to do in this map. So I'm going to move over to a map that I've already started, and I'm going to explain how each of these pieces all comes together. So um, as a starting point, I've added a source to my map as a SQL query. So at the bottom left of the screen, we have this blue button to add a source from, and we can see one option is Data Explorer. So if you wanted to add a table or a tile set without any kind of queries associated with it, this will open up that Data Explorer window. You just select the table you want. If you want to write some custom SQL, and have that turn into a map layer, you have the ability to do that as well. And so that's what I've selected here. And that opens up this SQL editor window that we can see in the bottom portion of my screen. And so this query, what it's doing is it's giving me the H3 identifier and a count of the number of rows that has that ID. And then at the end, I'm grouping by this H3. So this count function is essentially telling me how many GPS pings were inside that H3 and then I have a where clause in here where I'm saying where base date time, which is the name of the timestamp column in this data set, where this value is greater than or equal to this date window from and less than or equal to this date window to. Now these here, this might look a little bit unfamiliar to those of you that write SQL all the time. This double curly brace syntax is actually pointing to a component that I've set up here in my map. And so this is called a parameterized query. And so in the Cardo interface, 
you can click this button here in the bottom left to create a SQL parameter. And then you have the option of creating a parameter that either has a date as its data type or text or numeric. So in this case, I clicked date and I was able to go in and actually configure the window that I wanted the user to be allowed to select from. So in the case of this data set, I know it's full calendar year of 2022. So I can go in and select from January 1st all the way to December 31st. And then I can give it a name. And we can see here it's automatically generating these SQL variables that I'm able to use. So this was what I did in the setup of this map. In, in this case, I named it date window. And so now it gave me these variables, date window from and date window to. And in the top right portion of my screen, we can see this widget right here. And so now what I'm able to do is I can go in and I can actually click as a user and select a range of dates. And because I've tied this to my query, what we can actually see happen in real time is that it's going to go and refresh the map layer with only the data that you know, falls within those particular start and end dates that I've selected. And so here we can see if I filter just to a couple weeks in the month of March, this is what the data set looks like. Whereas maybe if I wanted to do you know, a data set covering the whole summer, I could easily go in and select you know, a three month span. And then it'll take just a moment to refresh the query and, and reload the layer on the map and we'll have the latest and greatest data available to us. Now, the other thing that we can do here also is go in and actually play with the styling of this data. Uh, because we're working with an H3 data type, we can go ahead and define different aggregation functions that it's gonna use in terms of you know, picking the right styling for the map with the colors. So the way that this works is you click on the layer in the top left and you can get into the layer properties. And here, uh, we have a number of things that we can configure. So we'll start off by looking at the fill color. So I have this set up. So instead of just giving me the same color for every hexagon, it's coloring each one of these hexagons based on a sum of the number of pings. So if we look back in my query, we can see that's just a count of the number of rows that have that particular H3 identifier. And so what we're doing here is we're saying, give me all of those pings. And if we're looking at a sort of aggregated zoom level where we're seeing larger sized hexagons, it's going and computing that from all of the children of that parent hexagon and it's giving us the, the right number. We're then able to tie this aggregation method, in this case sum, to a color ramp as well as a set of symbol breaks. So in this case we can see here I'm running from green all the way up to red and we, we're breaking the symbols in sort of a logarithmic fashion here. So 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, et cetera. The other thing that I'm able to do from this interface is actually control the resolution that it's going to show me at any one time. Uh, by default, it's going to show an H3 layer with uh, resolution at the level four, which is going to give you a larger size hexagon at a given zoom level. Um, so depending on the kind of data you're working with, sometimes that's actually a really handy uh, starting point because you don't necessarily want something that's too granular um, and, you, and the whole point of an H3 is to aggregate. So you kind of want it to show an aggregation sooner. Um, but depending on the data you're working with, sometimes you actually want to see a little bit more precision. And this is actually a case where, you know, this aggregate level might be helpful, but it doesn't really show us the full picture of the data. So I'm actually going to go in and adjust this and I'll set it to five. And we can see it's starting to show me some smaller size hexagons without me having to change the map view. And then similarly, if I go down to the six number, now it's continuing to show me the smaller size. Now I can actually start to pick out some different vehicle patterns. And in fact, if I go to some, uh, some more interesting areas, like say, for example, out near Cape Cod, uh, we can actually see some really interesting patterns of behavior in this data set through the aggregation and styling that we've done here. And so we can, once this all loads up, we'll be able to actually see different patterns of you know, how people you know, go out into the ocean and choose an area to fish. And like, where might there be hot spots that you know a fisher person might be interested in visiting if you know they have a boat and they want to go catch something? So this was part one of actually what's going to be a multi-part spatial spotlight. So when I return uh, for my next visit, we'll actually be looking at some of our analytics toolbox functions. 
where we can actually do some space and time clustering against this data to get a sense of where there are hot spots to be aware of and how that relates to, to the time component as well. Um, so more on that to follow and thank you for your time today.